Good evening. I'm Harold Pacious. We're on again with uh, another edition of Pacious on the News, where we try to keep up with public events, both national and local. And tonight, I'm very happy to say we have a old friend of mine, Ethan Strimling, a former uh, mayor of Portland, former state senator, uh, has been involved in many political campaigns, and he is, I suppose, fair to say, uh, a political observer. I don't want to hear him on the radio because I'm not around listening to the radio at the hours he's on, but uh, I understand that a lot of people are also familiar with Ethan as uh, a media personality. Ethan, welcome. Glad to see Good to you. Be. Good to be here, Harold. Good to see you. It's I been a while. Said, I haven't seen you uh, in a long while. Tell me, what, are you, what are you up to these days? Tell us, tell us what Ethan Strimling is doing. Well, I had back surgery about five weeks ago. I know you can relate to that because you've been through a few of those kind of uh, intrusive yeah. procedures, but uh, I'm doing pretty well uh, uh, in terms of that piece. But, uh, you know, politically, been very active. Actually, it's been a very good year, as I'm sure you saw, and we'll, we'll talk about it quite a bit. You know, we passed four uh, very substantial referenda last fall uh, to sort of transform Portland's economy and really protect some of the folks who are uh, struggling at the edges. Uh, we reopened the charter and we're now about to have the uh, charter commission elections. So I've been very involved in a group called People First Portland. And uh, that's been that's been tremendous work. You know, honestly, as I look back on uh, my first term as mayor, I'd say in the last year, we got uh, as much done as you could well imagine to get done uh, in an entire term. So feeling very good about the progress that Portland's making. Are you, uh, is it, it's called People First, uh, that's the Democratic Socialists, right? Yeah, it's a project of the Democratic Socialists. Um, it, it is a coalition. People First Portland was a coalition, labor groups, uh, all kinds of different worker groups. DSA started it and uh, sort of led the charge on the referendum that we put on the ballot. We put five referendum on the ballot. And we can get into these, you know, the, the five referendum were pretty much all things that the council had rejected, unfortunately, despite a lot of us saying to the council, these are clearly things that the people in the city want us to do. And so we decided to go directly to the ballot. And it obviously, when we had the kind of turnout we had, it proved the point that uh, the status quo just is not okay. And our city government needs to be much more responsive. So um, yeah, it's a broad coalition of all kinds of different groups uh, across the city, but progressives through and through, which is what the city of Portland reflects. So um, are you a democratic socialist? Uh, I've been a member, um, you know, I'm a lot of things for sure, but I think that the, you know, the issues to me are what matter the most. Um, you know, I'm a member of the Democratic Party, have been my entire life, and uh, there's a lot of things the Democratic Party does that I support. There's sometimes that they don't, and that's like membership in a lot of organizations, I suppose. We know a lot of people, for instance, in the city of Portland who are members of the Chamber of Commerce, but don't necessarily appreciate what the Chamber of Commerce does all the time. But um, I think the DSA has been doing really good work in the city of Portland, the main people's alliance, the main building trades, et cetera, have been very effective. And I think the people of Portland responded. You know, these initiatives passed with 60% of the vote. You know, you're, you're an old political hat. You know how this stuff works. When you win at 60% plus on average, you know you are reflective of the populace, especially when the other side spent a million bucks to try to defeat you. And, you know, I think what's really important in these issues, and we should go into them, is, you know, these were all things that the council basically looked at and rejected and said, People don't want us to do. And we kept saying that's just simply not true Too, too bought and sold by special interests. You know, when I, when I first ran for mayor, I remember sitting in your office and you're saying to me, Ethan, you got to have a vision. You got to drive a vision. You got to want to go somewhere and you got to try to get these people to follow you. And that's what I had. And uh, we're bringing that vision, you know, to fruition piece by piece. That work doesn't stop. That's for sure. You talk about the 60 percent on the referenda questions, uh, but Ethan, there are other measures of uh, the political temperature in uh, Portland and which way it's 
leaning. I mean, you're the most progressive politician around in Portland, at least the one running for public office. And uh, you were turned out of office. Uh, the, I, you know, I, I try to understand that. And I look at uh, uh, the vote in the districts and so forth. And um, a lot of these neighborhood districts where there's homes and people struggling to send their kids to college and pay their property taxes and so forth, they're not, I don't think they're as, as liberal as you or the Portland First people, but you would know better because I'm not an expert. You think they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have no doubt about it. You know, we passed rent control with 60%. We passed a minimum wage hike at almost uh, over 60%. We passed a ban on facial surveillance. These were all things that the council rejected. And these were all things that the people of this city, the Green New Deal, making sure that workers are able to get paid the wages they should be paid, you know, doubling the requirements in terms of how much affordable housing needs to be built, making sure that our the building in Portland is environmentally sound, meeting the challenge of climate change. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind the people of Portland are progressive. You know, this was the biggest turnout ever. And look, I, I think politicians, it's your job when you're running for office, you got to figure out how to win them. Uh, so make no excuses. Uh, but when we have the kind of turnout in which the most people ever, right? So you'll have to offer what your evidence is. My evidence is we had the highest turnout in the city of Portland that we have seen in certainly in 40 years. And with that level turnout, these very progressive, you would agree, referenda passed at 60%. And, and I'm not the most progressive um, politician. I appreciate your saying that. There's lots of uh, the members of our House delegation who are very progressive. We have a couple of progressive members of the city council now as well. So there's there's plenty of it. I, I think our problem is, you know, there's too much within our city government that's trying to protect the status quo. That's where we really see the problems. And, you know, what's your evidence that the people of this city, you know, don't support these policies? Well, I would say somebody, somebody Ethan, I'm trying to try take you on, but I was surprised that you didn't get more than 25 or 26 percent of the vote. Uh, where were the liberals? Why did the liberals and the Portland progressives desert you in that election? Well, uh, Harold, you know as well, and you contributed to one of the PACs, of course, that attacked me incessantly. I was disappointed by that. I'll be honest about that up front, that you were supporting them um, after your past support in terms of pushing me to have a vision. But you know as well as I do, when you push for change, it creates division. And City Hall didn't like it. And the Chamber of Commerce didn't like it either. And when you put together all the spending of my opponents, you know, you're talking about a quarter million dollars being spent to uh, get back to the status quo in City Hall. And But regardless, you know, personalities and policies, those things don't always connect, right? People can look at me and say, that, hey, that's not the personality, but the policies I support, and I believe that wholeheartedly. But, you know, again, Harold, you participated in um, supporting a PAC that, you know, first ever PAC that, of course, violated all kinds of ethics and got fined, et cetera, because of their violations run by a Republican um, that did real damage. You know, it's very difficult in an environment like that. But again, the policies passed in the end. So that's what matters most. You, know? you think the money in politics makes a difference, the big difference? Yeah, sure, of course. Do you? You don't think okay. so? Um, because the Democrats certainly, now I did not vote for Susan Collins, but the Democrats certainly raised a lot of money, including some from me, to defeat Su Susan Collins. Didn't work. Money didn't work. Yeah, but you come on. I mean, that's a that would be a simplistic analysis to say if you look at one race and make a determination. I mean, you're right. In our five referenda, we spent our side spent about fifty five thousand dollars in total. Their side spent almost a million bucks and we won. So did they spend their money badly? Yeah. But more importantly, they simply couldn't overcome the fact that these policies were so popular with the people of this city. So you can't take one race and make a determination. Susan Collins spent gazillions of dollars. And, uh, you know, in the end, when you look at all the spending on all the outside groups, you know, it's relatively even and you get to a certain saturation point. But 
boy, money in politics is just incessant. You know, if you look across the country, the candidates with the most money most often win. And that's, you know, pretty much indisputable. You know, one of the things we're trying to fight for now, of course, is clean elections in municipal races. Let's take the money out of politics, make sure the candidates have the opportunity to, um, uh, you know, get public financing so they don't have to be bought and sold by special interests. It's a, it's a real problem at City Hall. What do you think about the op- opposition? I mean, what? how could a guy like Donald Trump, a man with the worst character of any political candidate in American history, and there have been some bad ones, uh, get so many votes? What's going on? Well, there's a certain level of divide in the country, you know, that um, exists. There is, there is divide, but what I want to know is wh- why are so many people uh, – favoring a guy like Trump? Yeah, I, look, I mean, I, I can't give you any, you know, better analysis than other folks. He taps into a certain vein, a certain level of anger, um, taps into some, you know, emotional strains of racism, tries to find ways to get people motivated to turn out. But, but you know, he, he was resoundly defeated, right? It wasn't even close. And he never got a majority of the vote in either one of his elections. And he was resoundingly thrown out of office. And I think that was somewhat maybe around character. I don't know some of it, but I think it also was around the policies. And his policies and Republican policies just have not been putting people first. And that's what we're doing in Portland. And I think that's why we won those elections last fall. You know, it's very difficult. Remember, rent control had been on the ballot a couple of years before, and it lost, right? And that was a very low turnout. And that's the problem. We look at our elections and we say these low turnouts and we determine that somehow that is what the people of the city want. But then when rent control was on the ballot and we had the largest turnout ever, well, then we actually had, I think, uh, the kind of reflection of the electorate that you need. You know, as a little side note, you're talking about the mayor's races as we're getting into the uh, charter commission and we should talk about it. You know, the charter has been reopened. You know, 72% of the people of this city said reopen the charter, said that the charter commission that put together this elected mayor system failed in 2009. And it's time for us to open it up again and finally create an elected mayor, which I think you support as well. You've long um, been an advocate that our mayor ought to actually have the executive powers they have. They should have. Um, and hopefully we're on the verge of that. And my conversations with almost all the candidates that are running, um, not all of them, but I'd say 75 to 80% all recognize the mayor needs additional tools, needs to be anywhere from a full executive mayor to a much stronger mayor to be able to really implement the policies that need to be implemented in this city. Uh, I think that will finally get us to a place where we have a system and the old system was terrible. But one of the things that was wrong with it is we held elections in off years. You know, it was this weird idea that let's go out. And so, you know, an interesting note is that no mayor has received 20% of the vote of the city of Portland. Not a single mayor we have had, not me, not Mike Brennan, not Kate Snyder. And that's not reflective of what our values are. It should be much closer to 50% of the electorate. I mean, we have, we, we have that problem across the races and across the states, uh, prior to this prior election, which fired everybody up because of Donald Trump. So let the, the Democratic Socialists have a vision. And a Portland First is a Democratic Socialist organization. So I, I want to ask you about some of the things, and I'm, I'm sure that some of the things they're for you are not, some you are, but maybe you're for all of them. I don't know. But I went on their website to try to figure out where they stand on things. And I found out, and it, it, this is where I do differ with you. I mean, I, uh, I'm a Democrat, and uh, I agree with some things, but like the, I know Republicans who don't agree with Trump and don't agree with the far right-wing crazies. And there are some Democrats that are closer to the center than the Democratic socialists who are socialists. So uh, is there room in the nearer the middle for people in this country, or do you have to be on either extreme in order to count? 
I mean, come on, Harold, of course, there's, I mean, they're the Democratic Party. I mean, I'm not sure what you're saying. Right? Are you saying that Chuck Schumer, the Democratic Party somehow reflects um, the Democratic Socialists somehow or another? Or oh, I know. The, no, I'm getting, I want the, the, the I Democratic. Talk, I'm, I'm talking about Portland progressives, Portland first. And I'm saying, OK, for a moderate Democrat, somebody who's not into that, is there a place for them too? In, of in, course. In, okay. All right. Okay. I mean that that's where the that's where the Democratic Party is in terms of leadership, right? right. The Democratic Party is in uh, you know the the Republican Party has gone very conservative and pulled everything to the right. And while you say there are Republicans out there that don't support Donald Trump, they are very very few, right? Donald right. Trump got ninety four percent of the Republicans, that is higher than George Bush ever got, Yeah, right? That's no. higher than Ronald Reagan ever got. Yeah. He got more Republicans than anybody. So that's where the Republican party is. The Democratic party has been pulled to the middle, which makes sense as to why there are a lot of progressives out there who are saying the Democratic party needs to get back to its roots. People like LBJ who actually fought for and made clear that we need to make sure that working people in this country get a fair shake, right? You, the guy you worked for, the, one of your heroes in politics, was so much more progressive than the Democratic Party of today than President Obama was, who I love and I think did a great job. And I think Joe Biden is actually doing a very good job. He's kind of reflecting the core values of what the Democratic Party believes in. So there's no doubt, of course, the Democratic Party has tons of room for moderate Democrats. Moderate Democrats are um, you know, part of the leadership of the Democratic Party, much more so than Republicans. I agree with everything you just said. I agree with yeah. that. So I went online because I, di I didn't know that I, I, I didn't know that the referenda, the, the, the people first charter people were democratic socialists. I didn't make the connection between the two, but you know, one thing about the internet, you do find out a lot. And if you have a TV show and you got to prepare for it, it it's helpful. So, um, but I was, was all really, over the it was all over the papers, Harold. So I'm not yeah, sure what you missed. Yeah, it just shows you how dumb I am. Didn't get it. Didn't <laughs> get, get it. you to read the papers still. Yeah, didn't get it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, they they have a uh, a website which uh, goes lists the issues that they're interested in, and uh, and I, and I I don't know whether you're for all of them or probably not, but. Uh, one of them is to create a Portland Department of Labor, a new department in city government. Yeah. I, 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 are you for that? I mean, maybe. absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about it. You know, the, the so People First Charter is what you're talking about. People First Charter is a coalition. I know you want to keep talking about DSA, and that's great. Happy to do that as well. Um, but these are policies that um, reaching out to different groups throughout the city to say, hey, because I'm involved with People First Charter for sure, um, reaching out to different groups around the city and saying, what are some of the priorities? And right now in the city of Portland, there is no way for a local worker to go to city government to say, um, I'm not getting the wages I deserve, or my employer is making me work more hours than is legal. Um, and what people who are pushing for a Department of Labor in the city of Portland are saying is, you shouldn't have to go to Augusta to try to figure out how to make sure that you why, get your why not, Ethan? Why shouldn't you go to Augusta? People have been going to Augusta or for, for, for years to straighten these things. I've been a lawyer for 55 years. I've had these cases. What's wrong with going to Augusta? It's not that far away. It's only 50 minutes. How many, uh, how many workers have you represented in one? It, 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 Ethan. No, that's what I, I mean, because that's the important question. Because when I talk to workers, what they say is it's very cumbersome, right? You're at your employer, you know, and they're shortchanging you a couple bucks an hour. They're 1099 in you and they should be giving you the benefits that you deserve or they're making you work in an unsafe environment. You know, it's small Ethan, stuff that can have a big impact. Ethan, does the main Department of Labor have an office in Portland to serve these people in Portland? I, I guess I don't I don't get what your resistance is. What we're trying to do is make sure. I'm just saying, yeah, I, I'm just testing what you're saying. 
You're saying well, okay, so let me ask this. A, wait a minute. You're saying okay. that they shouldn't have to go to Augusta. And I'm saying, what's he talking about? There's a Department of Labor, a couple of offices here in Portland that serve these people. I don't get that. And, and all I would suggest is that you talk to some of the workers and see if that system is working for them. I, I think, look, if the Department of Labor in Augusta was as robust as it could be, but I don't know, Harold, do you think that we should not have a Department of Public Health in Portland, which we have? Because Lord I, knows Augusta's is, got a Department of Public that Health. That isn't the, Ethan, that isn't the question. And let's not distract. No, no, no. Let's no, no, no. On. I'm let's trying to. On. Let's move on. No, 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 because this is an important question. You, you want an office, suppose the office is next to, the Portland labor office is next door to the main labor office. What, why should you have a Portland office if you got a main office next door? So let me ask you this, Harold. What's the, the minimum wage in Portland? Uh, my predecessor, Mike Brennan, raised the minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour, and it's gone up, and now we're about to go up to 15 an hour, right? Do you yep. think that the state of Augusta is going to enforce our minimum wage of 15 bucks an hour? I think that if you should pass a minimum wage in, in federally, and I think it should be $15, and I think you should have... A now you're distracting. I just asked you a question. The city of Portland, look, the city of Portland has its own fire department because we have our own fire regulations. We also have our own worker protections, and the, st and the state of Maine does not enforce our worker protections. I I, I'm not going to pursue this. I'm not going to. I'm not going to pursue this because you can go right down the line. Should the should the uh, should the city of Portland replicate everything that the state does and everything that the federal government does? Maybe I'm not going to go through that. Let me. I understand, I understand your position. But... Your position is you're for it. Yes. Okay. That's good enough. Yes. And um, we should hire union labor. Yeah. You you want the city of Portland to establish a publicly owned bank. Is that true? Uh, no, publicly owned utility. No, this says, uh, this is a People First Charter, found a publicly owned Bank of Portland. Yeah, that, I don't think that that's People First Charter. I think that's somebody who put that in the portal themselves to let people vote on it. If you're in the portal, I think, which is People First Charter, which is great. Um, but if you look at it, you'll see which things come from People First Charter okay. and which just come from people in the public who have said it. So look at the logo. Okay. And if the logo says People First Charter, that is not a proposal of People First Charter. Uh, I haven't looked at that, but one proposal of People First Charter is a public utility. Uh, yeah. That I support 100%. Okay. And um, eliminate the downtown improvement district. Uh, yeah, that's not, again, that's not a proposal of People First Charter. That's So what you're looking at, which I think is probably good for people to know, is this is a portal that anybody in the community can go into and put an idea in and let people vote on and comment on. It's a, it's a, it's a vehicle that we created for the public to be able to have ideas that charter commissioners can take a look at. There are, if you look at it, there are basically 10 proposals. There are about 22 that are People First Charter. Number one is eliminate the city manager and create an elected mayor. Second is expand the city council, pay them adequately. Third is provide clean elections for uh, municipal races. Uh, next one is to have resident voting for all, um, all adults in the city of Portland to be able to vote in municipal elections. And then we go through a number of principles, such as do we want to make sure that the charter provides and ensures adequate housing and health care and transportation and a good environment? We want to have a publicly elected city attorney and city clerk and a publicly elected uh, public advocate for the city of Portland. We want a public utility. That's another one that's one of our values. We want to look at shifting funds from the police department. That's another one of our values and create a citizen review board. These are the ones that are the values of People First Portland, People First Charter, that you can see in that portal. And I think that what we're finding is that there's tremendous support for those ideas that people really do want us to transform our city. And, you know, the biggest thing, and, you know, this is probably the one that's going to be debated the most, is around creating a truly executive elected mayor. I think this is a place where you and I have agreed in the past. I don't know if we're still there or not, but um, I think that the people of the city are very clear at this point that having an unelected leader who's unaccountable directly to the voters um, 
in two ways doesn't work. Number one, that means that that leader is not necessarily reflective of our values. And number two, there's no real way to replace that person if you feel like they're not doing the job that they want to do. Just like you can replace the mayor, just like they replaced me, Mike Brennan. However, that gives people the opportunity to vote. I fully support that. Well, I fully support it too. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, I, I support it because of the need for accountability. There needs to be somebody at the top where the buck stops. And if the economy of Portland falters because of whatever reason, if people stop uh, investing money, if property tax levels begin to level off and decrease, somebody has to be accountable. And uh, so but, but, but while we're on that yeah. uh, subject, um, and as a full disclosure, I have two sons who are very active in the real estate business in uh, Portland. Uh, and uh, they are, quote, developers. Uh, although they don't build many buildings, they buy them. Buy them. But, uh, and they raise capital and invest it in Portland. Uh, but I sense, and I've talked to others, not you, I don't pin this on you, Ethan, but there is a real feeling among the group that you identify with of anti-development, anti-investment in Portland, and which is fine. You know, I, I understand what their, their views are. Why should these people come and invest money and make money in Portland? So where should the, where, where should the uh, city get its revenue? Because right now it comes from property tax mostly and from federal grants, et cetera. Uh, but the, and to do all of these things, to, to have all of these initiatives that the, the, these folks want, uh, they got to get some money and they've got to, I guess they are for raising property taxes on the wealthy, but when you raise, when you raise property taxes, you have to raise them for everybody because it, it, we have equal taxation. Okay. So it's all based on value. So if a poor person has a $250,000 house and a rich person has $250,000 house, they both say pay the same tax. So where's yeah. the money going to come from? Well, there's a lot packed in that. Uh, let me just get to the property tax question first, and then let's move backwards. Um, it's not quite true um, that you can't actually create a progressive taxation. In the state of Maine, you are allowed to create a property tax relief program, which one of the things I'm very proud of as mayor that we created, which gets targeted property tax relief to our lowest middle income families. And so a much better way of doing taxation is not to reduce the tax rate. Um, it's to make sure that you take whatever revenue you have and target it towards those low and middle income families. You know, the state program used to be called the circuit breaker, goes to a lot of families. Uh, Janet Mills did a very good job of enhancing it a little bit. Um, Paul LePage actually did a good thing in terms of he made it based on income and got it on the income tax. And the city of Portland has this program. And so we could actually do a much better job of um, making sure that our property tax relief goes to the families who need it most. Because I agree with you. And across the board tax cut, I mean, right now, there's a budget being proposed that has a 4% decrease on the city side tax, um, tax levy. That means the Jeff Bezos is going to get an almost $8,000 tax cut. Well, you and I both know that Jeff Bezos doesn't need an $8,000 tax cut. He's going to get an $8,000 tax cut, and the average family who has a $250,000 home is probably going to get $250. So instead of doing that, let's put the money into a targeted property tax relief program. That's more progressive. So that's a much better way of doing it. Okay. In terms of the issues around development, I think that all people are trying to do is balance the scales, right? When I was mayor, we every day, exaggerating, but every week we would hear from the planning department saying there is more development going on in the city of Portland since the great fire. We have not seen this number of permits coming through our office, which is why we had to do so much work to try to figure out how to streamline them as best as possible. We weren't as successful as we should have been, but the city of Portland has been developing. I mean, you walk down Commercial Street, right? You can see it. It is just wall-to-wall -wall hotels, development, luxury condos. 
And I think the response this past fall was basically, look, we have got to rebalance the scales. You can build housing, but you got to make sure that people can afford to live in that housing. Right? You can build whatever you want to build, but you better make sure that workers get paid a little better so that we can make sure that all the profits aren't simply going to the top. You can make sure that you're going to open your business, but we don't want you having workers in there working for the amount of money that they can't afford to live in our city. So it's not saying stop development. It's not saying that at all. I don't think anybody sees that happening even, right? Development is still going just as strong. What it is, is trying to balance the scales. And again, I'd go back to, you know, your hero, LBJ, who you've taught me a lot about. And I've read every one of those books that you've told me to read and more. And he understood you got to rebalance it. You have to find a way to make sure that, well, yeah, okay, we're going to have to put extra taxes on businesses in order to make sure that our elderly don't live in poverty. But that's okay, because they should have health care, Right. Our elderly should have health care, even if it means raise taxes on businesses to make them pay for it. That's what we have to be looking at as a community to say, we want Portland to work for everybody. I don't see any slowdown of development, right? I mean, you just can't see more cranes going up in any city in the state of Maine, more permits being, um, more permits being issued in any state of Maine, in any city in Maine. It's a rebalancing. That's what last fall was. So uh, I'm not going to, when I do agree with you, which I do frequently, I'm not going to say I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I, I feel it necessary, you know, I, sometimes, because there are people watching this show who agree with you, who will say, Harold Basis, and one of them said to me in a Portland meeting, you're a segregationist. And, you know, you know, they'll call you a racist uh, or, or whatever if they don't like what you're saying. And uh, I don't like that's what the right, the far right does the same thing. Far left and the far right behave often in the same way. Name call. I don't, I don't accept that. I don't accept that. No, you don't. That, they I, do. I, and, 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 and they do. I and hear I, you. I, 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 I'm not a victim, but I've been called names because I express well, an sure. opinion. And uh, the far right does that all the time. So, Except the difference, Harold, is, and I hear you, of course, there are knuckleheads out there everywhere, right? There are people who say things they shouldn't say everywhere. But the far right pretty much runs the Republican Party, right? And for us to create false equivalences, like the far right is some extreme minor piece when they stormed the Capitol, when the president of the United States sends dog whistles, it's not even close to a couple of people over on the left. Of course, it's not close. OK, yeah. hey, that that the Republican Party has gone as a party far to the right. The Democratic Party as a party has not gone far to the left. Right. No right. question about that. I, I, I agree with that. But okay. uh, about the about the cranes, you know, I I started living here in 1939. And uh, I've been around here a long time. And until the 1960s, nothing happened here. Between the Civil War and the 1960s, almost 100 years, there wasn't no, there are no new buildings, none, zero. And it can happen again. And it's happened sure. in other cities. And so, um, I know I understand uh, the view of socialists. I read a lot of history. I'm familiar with it's the view. Uh, you keep saying that, but it's the view of Democrats. Sixty percent of the city voted for this. I understand your. I understand your argument. Sixty percent. Sixty percent. I mean, how do we walk away from that? How do well, we say that's not mainstream? It's not like it was fifty point oh. You know something? I remember when. People voted to restrict the main turnpike to two lanes. Yeah. Okay. So there have been a lot of referendum. I remember when the Democrats yeah. passed a budget that made some sense. The Republicans said, we're going to have a referendum and repeal it. And it won. So I think these things sure. happen in referenda. And 
uh, is probably one of the reasons why the founding fathers decided to have a representative government rather than one read, simply run by referenda. But in any event, we don't need well, to get on that right. Well, it, it, look, it's, no, it's a good debate because I, I, don't, I don't think governing by referendum is the first choice. But when your government, in Portland in particular, continues to stymie things that the people know they need, what do you do? Right. You say that to me is what you when we passed gay marriage, we had to do it through referendum. And we did. And when we passed a statewide twelve dollar minimum wage, we did it through referendum because we had no choice. Has the referendum been used for bad purposes? Of course. But when you're in politics, I always say to people, be very cautious about trying to reject what democracy tells you they want, whether you are a politician who lost an election. Right or whether you are somebody who didn't like the outcome of a referendum. You have to accept it and you have to reflect. And the city of Portland with the largest turnout ever said raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour and pay people hazard pay. Is that gonna I, somehow I, I, or another be made I, the world? I, I understand your point and you've made it yeah. several times over and, and there are plenty of people that will agree with you. You yeah. push that point and I understand it. All right. uh, and I'm saying that, you know, again, they said that the main turnpike should not be expanded to three yeah. lanes on each side. And so I'm a little bit, probably uh, a little bit more dubious about referenda results than you are, but we have different views. But haven't, haven't elected officials done things too that you think are done? Constantly. Of course, right? That doesn't mean that you Constantly, throw out the that, elected So system. I don't go around, but yeah, exactly, but even right. though they do it, I don't necessarily defend it all the time because they did it. So, right. but you, but you do defend, you do defend the the representative government, even though the representative government fails sometimes, and not only fails, does the wrong thing. And that's all I mean about citizen initiatives. I don't think we should govern by citizen initiative. That shouldn't be our first recourse. But when your representative government fails you over and over again, I think that's where you have to say, okay. And, and interestingly, let me bring one point up about this. There were five referenda last fall, right? And right. one of them failed. Which one failed? The Airbnb. And I actually think part of the reason Airbnb failed is because the council had actually done work on Airbnb. It didn't go as far as people wanted, but it had done work. And so there was already a compromise in place and it didn't have as much momentum. Whereas minimum wage, nothing. Rent control, nothing. Facial surveillance ban, weak. And Green New Deal, nothing. I think the people said, they're not doing anything. We need to bring these forward. When our government did do some work, they actually stepped back. I was looking for a, uh, you know, who Nicholas Kristof is? He writes, he's a op-ed piece guy, op-ed uh, columnist for the New York Times. Yeah. Pretty liberal guy. And he's from Oregon. And uh, he wrote a piece about, be careful don't go too far uh, about Portland, Oregon, and all the reasons why Portland, Oregon is not quite as an attractive place uh, for people to move to as it used to be. So I, I think that you might get a little pushback on some of this stuff. You know, you, you, I don't know, understand some of it. Eliminate downtown improvement district. Well, for my sons, that probably, that'll save them some money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what's wrong with the downtown improvement district? Yeah, I don't take that. That's not a position I've had. That's just no. a position that somebody in Portland has had. I think, um, you know, some of what the issue is, is that downtown gets more services than other areas. And some people see that from the outside and say, um, maybe we ought to be doing that a little differently or use that money a little differently. But, you know, one time I did try to say, let's take some of the Portland downtown district money and use it for other purposes, which I thought were more important than what the purposes were, like the cadets and that kind of stuff. But I don't take a position to get rid of the Portland downtown district. I, I, I think um, we could expand it actually to other areas and do some more good work. It's an important tool. And interestingly, it's actually a tool that allows more progressive taxation because you put extra money, there's mostly businesses downtown, so they pay an extra portion in it. So. But, so, but I remember you being frustrated sometimes with Portland downtown district. I remember we were talking about that because you've got some buildings downtown and you're like, you got to pay all this extra money and what's it going to? I think that's the question. Oh, sure. What, 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 what's it going to? 
Um, so uh, here's one. Turn the entire Old Port and Congress Street from Longfellow Square to Lincoln Park into a pedestrian-only zone. Yeah, that's a, again, that's just an idea that somebody brought up. But yeah. um, I've actually, I kind of like the idea. I've often thought that we ought to turn Congress Street. I'd be curious your thoughts on this. You know, from Monument Square to Congress Square Park. You know how we had those art blocks and we'd close that street and it just would become this boulevard that people could walk on. I think it, you know, instead of doing it downtown where the tourism industry is already really strong, we need to get people who come on those cruise ships to get up into the middle of Portland. And if we created a, you know, a, a little a walkway there, I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be an interesting idea to try one summer and see how it goes. But um, that, that's not a policy of People First Charter. It's not something that I've been pushing uh, you know, when I was mayor for four years, I don't think I ever pushed it, but I did think it was a good idea to play with. The um, Back to downtown for a minute. Um, about 16%, 17%, 18% it fluctuates depending on the building, uh, of each building's income and when there's and when you have a lot of vacant space, it can be 25% goes to property tax. So the city and the property owners are partners. Yeah. If the property owner increases the value of the building, that's good for the city of Portland because they're partners. So it's in the city's interest to have it flourish and to have the downtown district flourish and to have the buildings maintain their value. Do you yeah. agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. And I think having a, having a vital downtown is really key. And, and I think part of having a vital downtown, certainly walkability is a very important part. You know, you have to balance that with the retail and sort of how does all of that work. But um, I, I think a vital downtown is really key to the entire city of Portland, very, very important. Well, I can tell you that Congress Street's a pretty dead street. Not as dead as it used to be. I will say that. It was moribund for decades but after they built the mall. But if you go out in Congress Street right now, you can count on two hands the number of people walking on the sidewalks. So I don't think the problem is any is is uh, no place for pedestrians to walk. They got plenty of room to walk. <laughs> They're just yeah, not there. Right They're just yeah, not there. Right about that. And, I, and I don't, yeah, I don't think it's a, an issue of a place. I think it's like, um, you know, Burlington did this and a number of cities, Santa Monica did it, you know, took a big boulevard and just turned it into a walking area. And a lot of retail came there and it became a real community space and people were able to perform and do all kinds of stuff. And, it made kind of this nice little downtown thing. I think that's what people think about when they talk about having Congress Street become um, just pedestrian only or something like that, or just buses. I mean, look, I mean, who, who in their right mind that's a Mainer, a Portlander actually drives on Congress Street anymore unless you absolutely have to, right? It's just, it's just tedious. So you take side streets anyway because it's just jammed. And there's not a lot of parking. So it's not like retail shops, you know, people come and park right in front of the retail shop to go into Rennie's. There's only three spots there. So they don't need the drive up traffic. So I think that's some of the conversation, but making our downtown more walkable, more livable, you know, I want more housing downtown. I think that's the huge key. How do we get more affordable housing right downtown would be huge retail first floor housing above. How, how, do, you, how, how do you get more affordable housing downtown? It's a good question. What yeah, are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you've got to incentivize it. You know, you, you certainly have to do it through zoning. We did some of that with uh, the referenda last fall. But, you know, as people build housing now, they've got to have 25% of it be affordable. Before, it was only one out of 10 units, so it didn't have much impact. But now, if somebody wants to build housing downtown, they've got to build much more. It's actually affordable for people to live in. Um, that will certainly help. Uh, doing zoning around first floor retail, all that kind of work is very important. But look, I, I, there's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of class B office space in the city of Portland that's not full, 
right? That's always been 10% vacancy, 15, 20, I think you were saying. If we could find a way to incentivize folks to turn that into some kind of housing, I think that'd be great because you get people then. Well, the only way to incentivize people is because it still is a capitalist country. So if people are not going to go to the bank and borrow a million dollars and take those because the bank will want it back. The bank wants it back. Yes, that's true. So uh, unless they can uh, make an investment in which there is a return. And so uh, you can say, okay, it's going to build, uh, it's going to cost uh, $5 $5 million to build this building. we got to put a lot of affordable apartments in it, which is fine. Um, but if they don't produce enough cash, enough rental income uh, to uh, pay the mortgage, to pay the bank, uh, then the person who makes the investment goes bankrupt. So right. that's what you got to figure out is, what, what, you know, how can you get them, incentivize them to do it? And one of the ways to incentivize them to do it is to make sure that they can pay off the bank loan. Yeah, I mean, we do it through tax credits, right? I mean, there's a lot of tax credit properties in Portland. We haven't got as many downtown. Maybe with the new, um, you know, 25% requirement, there'll be more opportunity for tax credit properties to develop. You can also do it through zoning. You know, you can incentivize, like on India Street, they incentivize if you go an extra floor with housing, you know, you're, or if you put a green roof, you can do an extra floor there, go a, go a story higher, you know. Down in Bayside, you know, one of the biggest failures uh, of my time as mayor, we sold 4.1 acres of property that literally could have built over a thousand units of housing. And we got about a hundred because we just sold it to who would give us the price. You know this story because you were involved in it, right? And we didn't say to developers, we you want to be able, we want, we want you to come in and show us the best you can propose for housing for this area. 10 stories up, first floor retail. Let's create the kind of housing that this city needs. We'll give you the property for free if you build what we need in the community, as opposed to coming forward and saying, you want to build what you want to build versus what we think. And what, I think that was a mistake. What, what do you mean by first ta- first floor retail? I just, it's not important, but. Well, just um, oftentimes, um, you know, um, planners will say it's important to have retail and businesses on the first floor and housing above. You know, if, if you go to a place like New York, for instance, you'll see that almost everywhere, right? Lots of housing. So the people live in the community, they come down, they use the shops but the shops are all on the first floor. You well, know, I, right? I, 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 I agree with that. The, pro- the problem here is uh, they do it and you should do it, but there's a lot of empty first floor space. I mean, I'm like, they, yeah. there's, a, there's a condo building at the corner of four and high street where you turn left to go up high street. Uh, yeah. And it's, and I think the building is not full. The building was completed two or three years ago First floor retail space for rent there. If you want to go down there, rent is still available. I know. And so, yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 look, the market, I've lived a long time and I, I've uh, been in and out of government and, and uh, I am uh, not a socialist. I do believe, not like the right wing Republicans, but I do believe that the market has a role to play. Look, that the Chinese communists figured that out. The Communist Party runs the country, but capitalism runs the economy. And uh, it's just so- a balance, though. I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe. I believe in the same thing. I think you and I only differ, maybe, and I don't even know how much we really do because when you and I really talk about it, I think we're a lot closer than perhaps we come across in some of these shows. But um, it's just a balance, right? I, I think that developers should be able to build housing but I want to make sure that there's some affordability to that housing. And I want more affordability than perhaps you do, because I think you also want affordability. I'm not somebody who says, um, just let the free market run wild. I don't think you are either, right? I'm not either. Are, right. Neither of us are. It's just where that balance comes in. And I think, you know, in a city like this, where we've seen rents go up 40, 50%, you know, over five years, you need some kind of balance that says, okay, we got to put rent control in place. You still get to make your profit. You still get to increase rents, 
But what you can't do is be gouging tenants so that nobody can afford to live in the city anymore. I agree with that. Yeah. No. I, I agree with that. The only thing I would add is let's make sure we have the, and I'm, no, no doubt there are people around, landlords, who will gouge tenants. And then there are also people around, landlords, who will not gouge tenants but need to get a fair return. And right. that's where government and people with ideas like you and me uh, have a, a big responsibility because, uh, you know, it's fine tuning the economy, saying, okay, we're going to decide how to fine tune this economy. It's a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. And oftentimes it hasn't worked. And look, what, what, world history is full of it. I believe in, in regulation. I believe in regulating capitalists. I believe that it, they shouldn't be able to just do whatever they want and squeeze people. I believe all of that. But, you know, Pablo Casals, the great cellist, was on television one time, and it was a, it was a PBS program, and he was conducting a youth orchestra in Puerto Rico. And they were doing the rehearsal, and he tapped his baton, and he stopped them. And he said, wait, wait. You have to understand, making good music is like making good government. Freedom, but with order. And knowing where that is on the spectrum is quite a trick. It's not easy. But because it's a trick and it's not easy, public policy makers should be careful. They should say to themselves, hey, this ain't easy. This ain't sim simple. And that's and all I'm saying. I'm with you. But you as somebody who's been on both the government policy side and on the capitalist side, we'll just put it that way, the developer side. Yeah. I think it's important that folks like you say to developers, hey, folks, stop lighting your hair on fire every time somebody wants to make sure you don't pollute a river, right? The Chamber of Commerce in, you know, in the city of Portland lights their hair on fire every time any kind of policy gets proposed. Now, you and I know that a $15 minimum wage in the city of Portland isn't going to destroy our economy. And you and I know that putting some environmental regulations on a building is not going to destroy our economy or a facial surveillance ban is not going to destroy our economy, right? But the Chamber of Commerce and developers will go around and continually say and spend a million bucks saying this is going to destroy our economy. So I, I, I'll make a pledge to you that on my side, I will do my best with the politicians and the political advocates to not go too far but you got to do a little bit on your side to say to folks, hey, stop lighting your hair on fire, because you know what? If you engage more and actually have a conversation, we could actually create policy in which it's not simply yes or no, but it's something we both can live with. Well, that's a very good point. I'm glad I got us into that conversation because you make yeah. uh, 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 a very good point, uh, Ethan. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, engagement is important. Now, here's the problem. We do things, we have kind of symbols that drive us apart. And the right does that all the time, you know, it just drives us apart. A lot of it's racial with them, so no question about it. But um, it, I think uh, people say, I wonder how the, the Democrats, after this big win by Biden, uh, running against Trump, lost seats in Congress, lost seats in Congress. Now, I have my own pet explanation for that. People, voters do look for simple phrases, simple things that motivate their vote. Defund the police. Those words, the words chosen for that movement, defund the police, turned a lot of people I, off that I know, I know are moderates who are scared to death about this effort to defund the police. To them, that means you don't want order. You don't want the police. To you, it means something entirely different. You don't want to eliminate police. You don't. You want to have police keep order in the communities. I know that. But the phrase defund the police. So it, it makes people suspicious. 
They said, no, these guys want to destroy things. Right. Well, and certainly you and I both understand words are very important. What I would say is gay marriage scared people, right? I ran a campaign in 1996 in which Dale McCormick was running for Congress and out lesbian. And it was very difficult to talk about things like gay marriage or even just gay rights. And it took us a while to make it not so scary. And part of making it not so scary is you keep talking about it. And whether it's desegregating schools, which sounded really terrifying to a lot of people, but you know what? Over time, you have to try to find a way to make it different. Black Lives Matter was really threatening to people when it first started coming out. It's become less threatening to people. It's become more accepted. People understand it better. So I'm with you. I understand. Um, And politicians have to be careful. But I don't think that advocates, I think advocates who are out there should be pushing the envelope. Advocates should be saying, you know what, 15 bucks an hour, which was scary to people when they first proposed it, because it was 10 years ago, remember? 15 bucks an hour. Now Joe Biden supports 15 bucks an hour. Right? Hillary didn't support 15 bucks an hour in 2016, but it takes time. So I don't get as angry at folks who are trying to push the envelope if what they are trying to do is to push the envelope in the right direction. I do think politicians have to be careful about what language they incorporate. Yeah, but I, I don't think, think that you- Ethan, I just think they'd have been better off, in my view, my personal view, probably saved a few Democratic seats if they'd said reform the police. Maybe, but I don't know because you know that the other side will paint it however they want. And I think defund the police has actually gotten the kind of traction that's actually changed the conversation. Reform the police is something that I think people could, anybody could say. And defund the police challenged people to think a little bit differently and to say, what we are actually talking about is redirecting some funds. Did we lose some seats over it? We might've, I don't know. I haven't really done the analysis that deeply in terms of who we won and who we lost. Um, but I will say, you know, it was, um, you know, I was very sad to see that we lost those seats. I think we lost those seats because Donald Trump has a, a real grip and he, he also had much higher turnout. And, you know, we got higher turnout because Democratic districts really turned out in a way that they had not turned out before. And um, okay. we have to find a way to have our party appeal to folks all the way down the line. Ethan. Well, we got only two or three minutes left. Yeah. So I think Portland is a very desirable place to live. I think a lot of people around the country who come here, who visit here, say, gee, this is a pretty nice, desirable place to live. So you're saying it's not. You're saying. No, no, that's not fair. That is not what I said. Oh, you're, you're saying. You're, that's like that's like saying before we want to stop development. That's like you're 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 just you're, you create this either or. Oh, you think, think Portland is an awesome city? Oh, you do. Well, look at. I just think that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Stop now. You think it's an awesome city? Well, the Portland City Council, which has all the power under our charter, yeah. the Portland City Council has been running it uh, for since 1923 or whatever. Uh, they've been in, in charge. I I don't think they've done a good job all the time, but look at the city. City's doing okay despite it. So uh, the council form of government, everybody says, well, it's the Klan that did it. Now, it was all across the country. The Klan was in Maine was upset because the Irish politicians in Portland, the Irish immigrants, were getting power. It wasn't about black people. There were no black people here then to speak of, just a handful. So, uh, and that's why the Klan was so active here in those days. But across the country, reformers, reformers across the country were saying there's too much corruption in city government and we need to have it more professional. Like you have a board of directors elected by the public and uh, a professional running it so that it's not, corrupted. That's why it happened. Well, except um, there was not corruption in Portland. You know that. There's no evidence of that. And they tried to pass the same charter reform twice before, and it failed. And then the KKK came in and said, we support it, and it passed. So you can't minimize the Chamber of Commerce 
and the KKK's collaboration because they've been trying to create this form of government before. And the most important part you said is that the reason they wanted to do it is not because there was corruption, because there is no evidence that there was corruption, it was because Irish Catholics and Jews and African Americans in the community were getting too much voice. And so they wiped out district seats. We had 36 okay, council Ethan, seats. Ethan, I just want to correct one thing. You're saying Afri in 1920s, African Americans in the Portland community were getting too, too much power? I put them all together. African Americans, Catholics, Jews, how many immigrant, immigrant voices. You, how many African Americans do you think were I think in there power were, I Portland, think, Maine? I think there were about 500 at that time. In how many African Americans do you think were in power in Portland, Maine? Oh, I, no, no, no. I'm talking about voting power. Oh, voting power. Okay. Voting anyway, power, that, not, that, not, that, not that, on the council. We're going we're to end, but you would agree, wouldn't you, that the council manager form of government, which I'm not defending, you know I'm not, the council manager form of government spread all over the country, all over the country, not Portland, Maine, not just Portland, Maine, everywhere, well, from coast okay, to coast. But, yeah, but uh, well, it, it, and now if you look at the major cities of um, all across the country, right? You look at the, the, the biggest city in every state, 43 of them have an elected mayor with executive power. Seven have that system. Yeah. And of the, of the lowest 16 of which we are part, only one has a council manager, some form of government anymore, and that's us. So clearly people have said to themselves, okay, maybe that was an appropriate government at that time. I don't think so. I think it was done for xenophobic reasons, but okay, it sure is not needed anymore. We All have right. other checks and balances. We have to, we, we could go on for another hour here. We could, so, we could. we'll do it next month. We'll have to do part two for, uh, for June. So I have to put, a, put, a, put an end to this one. Thank you very much for coming and being on the show. It was very interesting. Uh, you and I agree on many things and we disagree on many things. So that makes for an interesting uh, conversation.